great pleasure to welcome our JSN speaker this week, Professor Leila Devachi from the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. Professor Devachi received her PhD from Yale working with Patricia Goldman Rakesh and did a postdoc at MIT with Anthony Wagner. She went on to the faculty at NYU and moved to Columbia University in 2017. Professor Devachi has won a number of awards, including the Cognitive Neuroscience Society Young Investigator Award in 2009. Professor Devachi is interested in the fundamental question of how the human brain forms and retrieves memories. She leverages cutting edge neuroimaging techniques to analyze patterns of brain activation, answering questions like how we perceive events and our attentional states affect encoding, and how reactivation of patterns of activity involved in encoding are reinstated at retrieval and can support retrieval processes. In addition, she's interested in how replay during sleep may affect memory consolidation. So I think we'll be hearing about some of these topics in the talk today. Professor Devachi's title is Post Encoding Persistence of Encoding state strengthens individual memories, reorganizes those experiences based on shared features, and biases the fate of new memories. Please join me in welcoming Professor Devachi. Thank you, Barbara. Um, let me just share my screen. It's good to see all of you. Let me know if this works. Does that look good? Okay, so we've done a lot of work in the lab on temporal memory as well, and I'm not going to speak about that work on temporal uh, memory, subjective and objective temporal memory, because Dave Cluett is now a member of your university in, in the psychology department, and we I miss Dave tremendously, but you guys are lucky, really not lucky, you made a good choice. Uh, you guys were um, agentic in hiring Dave, and I hope you'll, when things go back to normal, find time to stop him in the hallway or out in the sun and have a conversation with him about his beautiful work on um, arousal and its relationship to temporal cognition, um, which he sort of had spearheaded in the lab. So good to see you, Dave, sorry to embarrass you. The talk I, what I will talk about today is the intersection um, between our attempts, I should say, of trying to understand how memories um, turn into what I will call knowledge. But let me sort of give you a schematic. So um, I have a favorite coffee shop that I discovered in San Francisco called Blue Bottle Coffee Shop. Um, every year when I would go to CNS, I would walk over and get a delicious cup of coffee. Um, and at the time I formed, uh, especially in my initial visit and uh, what I will refer to as a distinct episodic memory. So I remember the time and place and these colored nodes are just here to represent different features of that memory, visual features, emotive features, context, temporal and spatial context. Um, Blue Bottle was very successful. And I remember the first time I went to the Blue Bottle in Chicago as well and formed a distinctive memory of that. And it's sort of denoted here again by this sort of like colored, what you can call an engram. And a lot of work in my lab and in many labs across species have tried to tackle this important question of how episodic memories are formed and how they're retrieved. Um, and one of the ways in which we're trying to under, to extend this work, I should say, is to understand what happens after the initial encoding of these memories, um, especially when you've encountered many similar situations or contexts. Um, we might think that over time, these episodic memories might um, integrate to accentuate their shared features. And we might think of these orange nodes as knowledge, things that are common and more static features across similar episodic memories. Blue bottleness is what I'm calling that, sorry. So this idea of what is blue bottle, right? You sort of have the light wood, the delicious aroma and all the things that you'll see at all the blue bottles. So how do we, how do we learn, how does the brain come to represent blue bottleness? So let's take a step back and again, um, talk about the life of a memory. Um, again, during encoding, there's this sort of pattern of activity or an engram that may be formed that we know now from 
decades of research during retrieval when given a partial cue or in humans, when you ask them to retrieve a previous experience that what we see in the brain is um, the completion of or the reinstatement of the encoding pattern. And it's now been shown that um, this retrieval reinstatement is related to memory success, memory vividness, memory confidence. So it seems to really nicely track with aspects of detailed memory retrieval. But about a decade ago, we became interested in these the in-between period, these offline states, where it's thought that these episodic memory representations will replay. And this should increase plasticity um, in, in, in you know, LTP um, due to the temporal co-occurrence of replay and the temporal compression, I should say, of replay. And of course, we were extremely motivated by all of the beautiful work in rodents showing the existence of replay since the late 80s. Um, and we wanted to ask ourselves, could we measure this in humans? Could we do this with fMRI? And how would we convince ourselves that we were successful? So I want to give you a little bit of historical background into our early work and then pivot into this idea of, of understanding and trying to measure knowledge acquisition. So offline replay, um, it has been shown in the hippocampus, as we all know. Um, um, sharp wave ripples are these sort of rapid high frequency events that are thought to contain a trajectory of an animal's recent um, navigational experience through play cells. But importantly, these sharp wave ripples um, uh, or replay events are have been shown to be coordinated across hippocampus to cortex as well. There's a little less work on the cortical aspects of replaying the rodent models, but we know that that it is there, for example. And intriguingly, when starting this work, or you know, actually not when starting this, but once we had already started to look for signatures of replay in humans, we were really happy to see this work by Logothetis, which looked at um, animals who were in an fMRI scanner, but also being recorded from the hippocampus. So what this graph is showing is um, bold signal in cortical regions and subcortical regions of the monkey time locked to sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus. And what you can see here is uh, when a sharp wave ripple occurs in hippocampus, you see its increase in bold activation in cortical regions and some decreases, interestingly. Um, so this shows that activity in, in the brain writ large, but in cortex is sensitive to the occurrence of, of ripples, sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus, which, was, um, which is a good uh, starter. Now, just as review, replay is, a is probably our leading mechanism for memory consolidation. And when I say memory consolidation, I'm sort of broadly just talking about post-encoding reactivation, which may lead to consolidated memories. And we can talk about what consolidation means because there's sort of a big whole other talk that one can give about what does it mean for a memory to consolidate. But just sort of the building blocks here, hippocampal neural replay has been shown during sleep and awake rest and is importantly and is importantly temporally compressed. The compression is important because it is thought to induce plasticity. Um, this is just an, one of my pretty examples that I like of uh, play cells firing on a maze. And you can see the temporal compression here. So this is on the order of 200 milliseconds while the animal running here is on the order of five seconds. So you can see these cells are replaying in a temporally compressed manner. Replay uh, is accompanied, it's now been shown by hippocampal cortical interactions. These are all rodent papers. So in the rodent world, they also are showing these interactions between hippocampus and cortex triggered by replay events. And most importantly, several studies have demonstrated the functional importance of hippocampal replay by linking their occurrence with layer memory. So you can sort of muck with these replay events and show that spatial cognition changes, spatial memory changes. Um, it's also been linked with changes in neural representations over time and modulated by prior learning or novelty. So this is sort of like summing up the whole literature on replay and actually growing literature. It's still, um, there's a lot of that that's still being studied in the rodent, but this is sort of what we are thinking about as good background for the work that we're doing. So we asked ourselves back in like late 2000, 2009, I think it was 2008, can we measure replay in humans? And we thought this was like pie in the sky idea. Can we really do this? So I'll talk to you about that work first, looking at encoding um, and offline states. Do we see evidence for the persistence of experience related brain activity patterns into post encoding time periods? So this is giving you insight into how we operationalize the question in humans. Right? We're not going to be able to look for high frequency events with fMRI 
there have been papers now showing this with ECOG, uh, but with fMRI, we were interested in, in whether the bold signal would be sensitive to replay and what would we need to convince ourselves that that was the case. And then part two, we'll get to this question of knowledge acquisition uh, and ask how do memory representations change with consolidation and what's what's what I really mean here by consolidation is with multiple opportunities for replay events to occur, right? So we'll measure that as well. And then part three, I won't get to, but I will mention some of the like juicy tidbits of part three, but I wanted to put that up there because this is sort of where this talk is, is going, but there won't be enough time. So here's an example, just from a methodological perspective, there are multiple ways to look for what I'll call spontaneous memory reactivation with fMRI. And they all include taking a baseline measure of a brain state and then a post encoding measure of a brain state. And this is important to know uh, basically how the encoding experience itself has shifted or in, in, induced plasticity in the system. The first one, um, this is taken from a TICS paper by Ariel Tambini and I, I'll call, call local activation patterns. What I really mean here is the static pattern. You can look at um, activation in voxels of the hippocampus, that's what you're looking at here, and get one vector that represents the static activation pattern. And you can simply look at the similarity of that activation pattern um, between encoding and post-encoding rest using the baseline as a control. So you could ask, is this more similar? In other words, does it look like the encoding pattern is persisting into post-encoding rest? And then you can use baseline as a sort of uh, uh, control. You can also do create multivoxel correlation structures, which include uh, spatiotemporal information. So from each voxel, now you're taking the temporal bolt signal over time, over 20 minutes or over 30 minutes. And um, you can then ask how correlated are two voxels next to each other. And you can create this correlation structure that represents, let's say, the encoding experience. And again, you can then ask how similar is that correlation structure to post-encoding time periods? And is it more similar than what was there pre-encoding. And finally, to get at systems level interactions between brain regions, um, an approach that we've taken is looking at how two regions, two brain regions, let's just say hippocampus and visual cortex, might show correlated um, bold activation profiles. So these are temporal pro profiles during encoding. And you can ask whether those two regions that you may think were engaged during the task show an increase in connectivity after an experience compared to before the experience. So these are just different methodological ways that you'll see in different papers that are basically trying to look at how an experience, this encoding induces plasticity in the system, locally, in brain regions, as well as across brain systems. By the way, if there are clarification questions, you can, you can um, speak up. Okay, let me take you through the, the initial paradigm that Ariel Tambini embarked on. And she had uh, was an undergrad at MIT and had worked with Matt Wilson. So she was the perfect student to embark on this um, adventure with me. She was brave. She was also a rotation student at the time. So I, I felt like, okay, if it fails, we'll be still in good waters, but it didn't, which was exciting. Okay, so what we did is we had people come into the scanner and we wanted to create two different experiences. Um, and you'll understand why when, when we're looking at the results. But what we, we first had them um, um, engaging, like one of the tasks was an object face encoding task and the other was a scene face encoding task. And just like their names uh, denote in the object face task on each trial, people were shown a picture of a face and an object and the scene face, again, they were shown a scene and an object. And the participant was asked to make a different decision on each of these in each of these tasks as well. We really wanted to create two different mental contexts that we can measure in the scanner. Because our first question was going to be, does the hippocampus show differential patterns of activity for these different contexts? Just like you might look for remapping in a rat put into different spatial contexts, for example. Um, we can't move people. We don't want them to move at all, in fact. So we have to try to create different mental contexts. But importantly, what we did is we, before one of the tasks, there was a baseline rest scan where we simply told them to close their eyes. This is when they came you know, off the streets into the lab. The first thing we did was get a, an uh, assessment of resting activity. Then they performed one task and then we had a post um, object face rest task. All the rest scans here will be in gray and the outline will refer to what task preceded that rest scan. 
So for the first analysis, you can imagine taking uh, one voxel in the hippocampus, and we did this on each person separately. We drew an anatomically defined hippocampus, and this is just thought. This is just shown to represent the bold activation over time. You can do that for all the voxels, and then create uh, a multi-voxel correlation structure. So this is from one of our participants showing that correlation structure. And what we can then do is ask, uh, we can do that same analysis for the post object face rest, as well as the baseline rest. And then we can correlate these with each other. And you can see there's a non-zero correlation between um, the multi-voxel correlation structure during baseline rest and that during encoding. And that increases in this participant from the task itself to the post object face rest. So you can look for a change in this correlation value with experience. Now we also um, had a multi-voxel correlation structure defined during the scene phase task for all our participants, and they were counterbalanced as to which task they did first. And the first question was, are the multi-voxel activity patterns distinct for the two tasks? And um, what I'm showing you here is the pattern similarity, both within in blue and red, this is the object face object face, um, scene face, scene face, as well as across tasks. So we basically just took an early time point in the object task and a later time point um, and controlled for time in the across task. So time is controlled for here. Uh, and that's important in imaging because you do get a drift in the signal. So you want to make sure the same amount of time has passed. And what you can see here is indeed we do have evidence for greater within task similarity compared to across task similarity, which is nice. And that hadn't been shown before. Um, and it's sort of the basis for us being able to do the next analysis. So now that we think we do have different hippocampal patterns that characterize the these two tasks, we wanted to ask, do these encoding patterns sort of specifically persist into post-task rest periods? So let me just take you through this graph. What I'm showing you are three rest periods for the entire group of participants, uh, the baseline rest, post-object task, and post scene task. And what, what's plotted here is similarity with the object face encoding task itself. And what you can see here is that encoding face patterns do indeed selectively persist into post object rest greater than baseline and more so than in the post scene rest, uh, suggesting that indeed we are measuring some sort of persistence of these encoding patterns. And remember, this is about an eight minute rest scan. This, and, and if we look over the rest scan, it doesn't seem to diminish over time, which is sort of interesting. And then we can do the same analysis for the scene phase task. And you can see here that scene phase task patterns show more similarity with post scene rest compared to baseline rest and marginally so with object rest. So then we, so then we wanted to shift to looking at systems level interactions. Do we see that connectivity or correlated activity across the hippocampus and cortex is modulated by these encoding experiences. So again, in the same data, um, but a different analysis, what we've done is now during baseline rest, you can look at, let's say, two cortical areas, FFA, a face area, and LO, which is an object. Um, you can think of broadly as an object area. And, you can, and it's not surprising that right off the street, there's a non-zero correlation between these two visual areas. Um, and this differs obviously per participant. But then after 21 minutes of viewing faces and objects um, in a very routine way, right? So we're really driving these cortical areas in temporal succession. What we see is a dramatic and visually striking increase in the correlation between these two correlated areas. Again, that lasts several minutes in the scanner. Uh, this is my best subject that I'm showing you. This is just one individual. So of course I've chosen this because I think it is pretty striking to see that this correlated activity does indeed um, increase uh, from baseline rest, but also is persistent over time. So let's look at how we analyze the group data. So now taking the group data, and I'm not only showing you tidbit, tidbit of data from this paper, but we extracted a hippocampal region or defined a hippocampal region that correlates with later memory in all our participants. And I want you to pay attention to this graph first. What I'm showing you here again is across these rest scans, um, now what's plotted here is connectivity between the hippocampus and lateral occipital complex, a visual cortic cortical region. And you could see that after the object phase task, there's a significant increase in connectivity during rest between these two regions. 
Um, and this was greater than what you see during the scene phase task, interestingly. But if you look at the task itself, both um, the object phase task and the scene phase task seem to produce a similar level of connectivity between the hippocampus and LO. So why this distinction? Interestingly, memory was better following the object phase task compared to the scene phase task. We didn't bake that into the experiment. It sort of fell out of, of in general, it's easier to remember object phase pairs and scene phase pairs. So at the task level, this data suggests that the increase in hippocampal LO connectivity or systems level interactions is related to later memory at the task level. But we wanted to look at that more closely at the person level. So what, you, what I have graphed down here, and this is very similar to early papers looking at replay uh, during sleep, it's in, but instead of sleep, we have rest periods now that are bookending this experience. And let's just look at the baseline rest period. What, what I'm graphing here is hippocampal LO correlations. This is connectivity. This is really just correlated bold activity. Um, on the X axis is associative memory. So how well people remembered the individual faces and objects or the faces and scenes, the pairs of them. And what you can see here is if you're just taking your best line, baseline rest, there's no relationship between baseline connectivity and later memory for the, the experiences that you're about to encounter. But now when you look at post-task rest, so this is this period right here, the extent of hippocampal LO connectivity here was positively correlated with how well people remembered the preceding object represent object face representations and object scene representations. In other words, we are showing that there is systems level plasticity that we can measure with fMRI. And secondly, that at an individual level, the extent to which you show increases in this plasticity and this connectivity predicts how well you're going to remember what you just encountered. So we really think that this is getting very close to arguing for re looking for replay or reactivation or persistence of representations that relate to later memory. And this is, sorry, this is just a subtraction of the two. So post-task minus baseline, you still see a correlation um, uh, with later memory. And Arielle went on to do her postdoc with Mark Desposito and just published a beautiful paper that I wanted to highlight here using TMS. So uh, she used transcranial magnetic stimulation, which sort of, let's just say, for sake of a better term, mucks up act, you know, electrical activity in the underlying cortex. Um, when, there was, when she um, pointed the TMS wand at a control region, um, not lateral occipital complex, which we found in the neuron paper to be related to memory, she replicated the neuron result that we got where in, you know, a change in hippocampal LO connectivity after learning um, predicts associative memory. So that's a replication of our prior work. And then additionally, beautifully showing that TMS to the LOC messes, messes up that relationship. So in other words, it messes up. So the connectivity itself is now no longer related uh, to memory and the connectivity measure itself is reduced, which is really nice. So, so what we've shown in sort of in a correlational manner with fMRI seems to hold with um, this more causal uh, manipulation. Okay, so once we were at this point, we were very excited um, and we wanted to then ask ourselves if this post encoding, if these post encoding measures of reactivation were modulated by factors that are known to modulate consolidation, we should be able to move them around. Things like reward or punishment, things that, you know, factors of an experience that we know modulate long-term memories, increase the probability of you recalling those long-term memories. Are they really modulating long-term memory through replay mechanisms? And in one of uh, the studies, we, we first modulated reward. So in this study, Deep Humerti, um, who's now a professor at Temple. Now we have two different kinds of encoding trials. Um, and we, we, for each person, tagged the category of the rewarded trial, the green star, or the, the low, this is high reward and low reward, really. So you were given a cue that you could win a lot of money if you remember a picture of my prior graduate student, Andy Heiser, or you would get a much less memory if you remembered a picture of the scene. And, and all of the high reward for each person was in the face category and the low reward was in scene category and we counterbalanced that across people. And we did this because this allowed us to look at cortical regions 
that where you were receiving high reward versus low reward to see if hippocampal cortical connectivity with those cortical regions was modulated selectively. So again, we're looking for this sort of selection process. Um, let me take you through this. So basically what we found um, in, is indeed that, um, let's look down on the x-axis here, we have a change in connectivity between this is anterior hippocampus and category selective cortex. So in this case, for high reward, it would be FFA. And for low reward, um, uh, it would be PPA, right? So what we see is that the extent to which people remembered these word face associations when they were high reward was related to connectivity between hippocampus and FFA. And if the high reward was seen, it would be related to anterior hip PPA connectivity. So this suggests a little bit of a more complex picture with not just that regions that are engaged in sort of a heavy in manner, then continue to show increased connectivity during rest. But instead, when you have experiences where some things are tagged as high salient and low salient, that the brain might actually modulate connectivity with um, hippocampus, hippocampal cortical connectivity with these cortical regions. So thinking of the post-encoding brain as being a bit smarter and, and sort of selecting for information that is relevant, or at least adding to the selection. Um, and interestingly, it turned out that posterior hippocampal category selective cortex connectivity, this sort of gray bar did correlate with memory for low reward information. So that's like another tidbit for those of you who are interested in sort of dorsal ventral hippocampus and rodents or anterior posterior differences in humans, it looks like they may be differentially sensitive to reward. And this fits in with what you would expect given the anatomical connectivity of dorsal and ventral hip in, in rodents. Oh yeah, I showed that to you here. Sorry, just so this is what I just showed you, the anterior hip and then the posterior hip shows a correlation with low reward and not so much with high reward, which I think is another interesting um, result from this, this study. Okay, so now we show that encoding patterns can be measured um, with fMRI. They do persist into offline states, immediate rest states, and they relate to memory. So we think that we have a good, uh, I don't wanna say biomarker, but really, really a marker of plasticity in the human brain. And one obvious question, um, and one that I got a lot when I first started to talk about this, where, well, do you need offline states to be able to see this? Does the brain need this? Do you need to have a moment where you're internally focused, where your eyes are closed, where the rodent, think of the rodent like grooming on a maze, right? Do we need these moments of, of whatever you would call those states? Does the brain state matter? And we haven't completely answered this question, obviously, but we did dive into some of our prior uh, studies where we had a break between encoding and retrieval but when people were actually engaged in another task, they were not actively resting. Um, this is a study by Catherine Duncan and Alexa Tompery. And in this case, they we had um, included a math block in between several blocks of encoding and retrieval. And this was to uh, discourage anyone from rehearsing the information um, and, and really just to make sure people were you know, engaged in another task so we can eliminate that possibility. And so, we decided to look at this math block. Now it gets a little bit complicated because you can't just look at correlated activity across time because there's a lot of correlation in the structure of this task. There's an onset of trials, there's a motor response people have to make. So in this analysis, what we did is we, um, let's take for example, two regions we focused in on, perirhinal cortex and the VTA. This study was really looking at novelty and we were interested in VTA for reasons I won't get into. But if you look at the raw signal, you can see a lot of correlated signal just with the onset of the trial. So what we did is we put this into a model and we regressed out the trial level um, information and used the residuals of the model to look for connectivity. So now we're looking at correlated activity in the residuals of the model during uh, this math block. And let me show you some data from encoding. So this is when people are viewing the paired associates that they're um, learning. What we saw, one result from this paper, and I'm just sort of cherry picking results to make the point, one result that we saw as CA1 VTA connectivity um, during encoding was predictive of long-term associative memory for those object pairs, which was the main result we reported in this paper. Um, but then we went back to this data set and we said, well, would we see the same relationship during the post-encoding math period? 
And indeed we do. So when people are doing math after this object encoding task, we still see that VTA CA1 connectivity while they're performing math is predictive of long-term memory for those object pairs, which suggests that this connectivity that was laid down during encoding persisted into this math period and we could also measure it. And just as a control, we don't see a similar relationship with other ROI pairs like the VTA and perirhinal, for example. Oh, this is a, where I made a mistake. Okay, here it is. So another study where we had an opportunity to look at offline states during a task was um, a study geared at looking at agency and memory, another area that we're interested in the lab. Um, and basically the main task, people have a choice of pressing a left or right button that has a kanji character on it and a, an object is revealed. But importantly, before and after this encoding task, they engaged in another task where they were just simply rating how much they liked each character. They simply had to say on a, on a scale from one to four. So they were, they were seeing a stimulus and rating it. And we wanted to, again, ask if we can measure changes in um, systems level interactions during while people are performing a task that relate to later memory. And here I'm just showing you coupling between hippocampus and perirhinal cortex. This is the pre-encoding period over here, and this is the post-encoding period. And what we can see here is that there is indeed a significant increase here and a marginal increase. Uh, this is left and right hippocampus from pre to post-encoding. So after viewing objects, um, uh, which we know should drive perirhinal as well as hippocampal processes, you see an increase in hippocampal perirhinal coupling that's measured while they're viewing and performing another task. And importantly, across subjects, the extent to which people show an increase from post to pre connectivity predicts their later memory for these objects the next day. So again, this is just like the story I told you with the original paper where people were resting, now they're doing a task and the brain activity that we're measuring during this other task is predicting later memory. So in sum, uh, we can measure reactivation replay using fMRI in humans. These measures are sensitive to factors that enhance memory consolidation, such as reward and agency or choice. Preliminary data, now not so preliminary, suggests that this persistence can occur when the participant is not resting per se, but rather performing an unrelated task. And these first demonstrations have now happily been replicated uh, across many labs, um, too many to list, um, and they have been extended in many ways. So there are many papers now that include pre and post encoding rest periods to be able to look or have another sort of more independent measure of plasticity that may not be captured so well by the encoding experience. Some of those domains are motor sequence learning, and I have the references here if you're interested as well as in fear learning. Um, and there's, there's a reference here if you're interested as well. So, um, it seems like the persistence of brain states, what I'm calling brain states, into post-encoding time periods seems to be sort of a general function of, of what the brain may be doing in terms of learning uh, more broadly and not something that is necessarily specific to the circuits that we've been studying in the lab. Okay, so let's shift gears. Um, what time is it, by the way? Oh, good. I didn't go too long. Okay. I know you probably exhausted on the other end, but we've made it through more than half. Okay. So that was part one was really looking, can we measure replay? What can we look at during rest? And this sort of opened the door to the more interesting question, I think ultimately was because in humans, we can show humans so many different trials with different features, um, we, should, we really wanted to take advantage of, and we can give them instructions, you know, which is great. So we, and they leave the lab once they're done on the fMRI scanner, we don't have to take care of them. And, and, uh, so we wanted to take advantage of, of the, you know, trying to model the complexity of, of the experiences that we have to ask how do memory representations change with consolidation? And just quick background, we focused in on MPFC. I've thought a lot about other cortical regions that we can talk about, but for this one paper that I'll present, there's a lot of reason to suspect that MPFC may be really important in the representation and retrieval of long-term memories. Uh, for example, the VMPFC has long been known to be more active during, and this is with early immediate gene measures, uh, immediate early gene me measures, as well as fMRI. It's more active during remote compared to recent retrieval. 
Um, it's differentially contributes to the encoding of information that's related to, in, to stuff we've already know. So if you are learning something new about an old concept or schema, the, uh, the BMPFC will be more active, which is sort of interesting. It's like you're activating potentially that knowledge while you're learning about new, new features. So we wanted to ask, does the medial PFC support the representation of regularities across new experiences? This is the blue bottleness question. So in this study, uh, what we did is we showed people individual trials, paired associate trials. On each trial, they were presented with a trial unique object, but the manipulation that we use to look at uh, features that share that overlap uh, is that we, presented each object with one of four repeating scenes. So they saw 28 trials with the same jungle scene, 28 trials with the same bedroom scene, and 28 trials with the same city scene and beach scene. And this allowed us to ask not only what is the representation of these individual memories, but do they come to show an organization that looks like this? In other words, are memories that share similar features that have overlapping features, do they come to be represented similarly in the brain, in this case, in ventral medial PFC was the question we set out to ask. Um, and more importantly, not more importantly, but additionally, does this emerge with time? Is this dependent on consolidation processes and potentially post encoding replay? Um, so this is just to give you a schematic of what the initial memory representations might look like this, but they might have a common core feature that is related to the fact that the jungle scene is in common across all of these trials? And do you then start to see that this core representation is augmented or strengthened uh, with, with time or with repetition? So in this study, Alexa Tampari um, set off to look at this. So again, day one, just to take you through the overall design, participants came into the scanner, they encoded 100, 128 pairs of um, the trial, trials, just like the ones I showed you. Um, they were shown those three times each. There was sort of a learning period. Then they were only asked to retrieve half of the pairs right away, an immediate retrieval, and they came back to the lab a week later and retrieved the other half of the pairs in the scanner. So this allowed us to look at how memory representations change with time during their retrieval. Again, these are the trials I just showed you. For each trial, they saw a pair and they had to come up with a vivid mental image that combined the two, like typing on your keyboard at the beach, which some people may be able to do who live in California. That's a very hard image for me to come up with, but <laughs> maybe not for you. Um, and then importantly, during retrieval, we now stripped away the visual feature that, that brought all of these trials together. They were no longer shown the beach scene or the jungle scene. They were only shown the objects. So every object was trial unique during retrieval. They were asked to retrieve the associated scene. And then they, they gave us a confidence judgment. And they did the same thing at remote retrieval. This is just showing the behavior. Not surprisingly, memory was really good uh, day one, right after encoding, but and memory decreased after a week, but it was still above chance here. Chance would have been 25% uh, correct here. So they still had significant memory. And the data that I'll show you today are all from correct trials only at one week. So the analysis sort of took this flavor. So again, we have all these separate trials, but they have shared features. We'll call those overlapping um, uh, trials. And then there are non-overlapping trials, right? Trials that are just really unique and they don't share these features. And now in the brain, we can examine um, patterns of activity um, during retrieval. Again, they're not seeing the scenes for, for objects that were initially learned with the same scene and compare that to objects that were learned with what I'll call non-overlapping scenes. And then we can look at where overlapping um, patterns of activity, uh, where, where I should say patterns of activity look more similar to each other when they shared features. Sorry if that's confusing, it's like a lot of different words, but we could basically look at whether all the jungle scenes have come to be represented similarly in the cortex and whether that's dependent on memory. We can also look at encoding retrieval similarity, which we did in the paper and I won't talk a lot about today, but you can ask me about that. That's a measure of reinstatement and maybe more sensitive to episodic details. Okay, so let's take you through the data. So now we're focusing in on a region of MPFC. And what I'm graphing here is the similarity across all of the trials that share features in blue. Those are the overlapping trials and doing a comparison with the non-overlapping trials. 
And the overall similarity in these neural representations does not differ when during immediate retrieval. But then interestingly, at one week, we start to see the emergence of structure in MPFC, structured context. So you see that now the jungle scenes are all represented more similarly and more distinctly from the other scenes, suggesting that now these contexts or these memories have come to be presented, represented based on their shared features. Now, importantly, other regions that are engaged during remote retrieval, like the posterior medial cortex, this is probably retrosplenial cortex, another region that's really involved in consolidation does, in, our, in this data set did not show that effect. So it was specific to MPFC over retrosplenial cortex. And something that was really interesting um, and sort of touches on the debate about whether memories become distinct from hippocampus with consolidation and whether the hippocampus represents shared structure was that in the hippocampus, we actually saw the same effect. We saw that at one week, the overlapping memories were represented more similarly compared to the non-overlapping memories. And interestingly, there was a hint at recent retrieval for pattern separation, which is something that people have talked a lot about in terms of the hippocampus being involved in separating similar memories. There's a little hint of that here, but wait a week and look what happens. It looks like the semantic features or the core shared features are now represented more similarly in hippocampus. Again, we're interested in anterior posterior hip and you see the same, when you look at it separately between anterior and posterior, you see the same pattern in anterior and posterior, but interestingly, you see more of a shift towards separation overall in the anterior hippocampus compared to posterior. So the patterns are, are intriguing and different, but they all, they, they look similar in terms of whether overlapping features are starting to be represented more similarly with time and consolidation. And then finally, as an exploratory uh, analysis in this paper, we wanted to ask whether this kind of structuring that we see in hippocampus or MPFC, if that's related to post-encoding processes immediately after learning. And, and what we see, this is the only pair that we saw this in. So now I'm showing you retrieval similarity in anterior hippocampus. So this is the extent to which um, you, people show more overlap for similar memories compared to non-similar memories. So this is sort of the structured um, analysis that we basically that I showed you here. It's, it's this greater than this. As a function of connectivity immediately after learning between anterior hippocampus and MPFC. And what you see here is there's no relationship between post-encoding connectivity, the systems level, uh, correlated activity, and remote retrieval similarity. I mean, recent retrieval similarity, but there is at remote. So immediately after experience, after an experience, the extent to which hippocampus and MPFC are showing correlated activity does correlate with or predict remote overlapping representations. So this is sort of, again, it was exploratory in the paper and we are following up on this in other studies to try to look at the relationship between now this persistence of encoding states or, consolid or biomarker of consolidation and long-term memory representations and their overlap. We've also done some work in sleep. Um, um, Emily Cowan took on this, our first sleep study and showed that spindle density immediately, not immediately, but during the nighttime after learning uh, predicted the overlap between those memories encoded before learning in the BNPFC. So we not only see that with time overlapping memory representations emerge, but that first night of sleep uh, spindle density also seems to correlate with overlapping representations. What's here on the x-axis x -axis is a little confusing. The SL is the sleep list, so those are the pairs that were, were uh, encoded before sleep, and the, and the ML is the morning list, so those shouldn't have a relationship with sleep. So this is just a subtraction between the two. But we're starting to look at sleep as well and its role in sort of distributing and organizing memory representations. So one thing I didn't tell you is that visual cortical regions exi also exhibit neural overlap during retrieval of memories with similar features. So jung the jungle memories, right? But this is irrespective of time. So we see overlapping memory um, representations in visual cortex during the recent time as well as the remote time. By contrast, overlapping memory representations emerge with time in the hippocampus and medial PFC. 
And post-encoding cross-regional correlated activity, what I call connectivity, appears to play a role which potentially implicates neural replay, or that's sort of the suggestion that we would like to make. How and why does this happen? How does this happen in the brain? And there are sort of two possibilities, strengthening the neural representations of the shared features, the redundancy. So if you're seeing the jungle over and over again, the brain might prioritize that particular aspect of the engram, or if all of those episodic memories imagine getting replayed equally, you're going to have a lot more plasticity in the parts of the engram that represent the, um, the jungle itself. So it could just be be a strengthening and LTP. There also, of course, is forgetting. So over time, what happens is you might forget episodic details, and what you might be losing are those episodic details, um, and that what happens is you're sort of stripping away the weaker elements of memory, but leaving the core elements of memory. And the likely answer is probably both of these things, which is usually the answer in science, I find. So we're not pitting them completely against each other. We're starting to consider how both of these operations, both strengthening and forgetting, and maybe they're even part and parcel of the same process. It could be that replay um, in and of itself might lead to both of these outcomes. And that's another question that we're starting to try to um, address in the lab. Okay. Oh. Oh. Sorry, I had a little glitch on my. Maybe it's gonna, okay. So, sorry. Um, so open questions, just to sort of end, uh, get towards the end, is that now we feel confident that we see post-encoding, I'm putting replay in quotes because I'm not confident it's the same kind of replay as what we're seeing in rodents, but it has a lot of the features of a consolidation mechanism. Um, and we also see reinstatement of those patterns during successful retrieval. Um, and some of the questions that, in addition to the ones I've mentioned already that we're really interested in looking at are how is hippocampal cortical connectivity related to these fast replay events? So ideally, we would want to be able to um, measure both these rapid replay events as, as well as a slower kind of uh, sort of blood-based signal in the brain to look at how correlated they are. I think that would really bring the field forward and bridge the gap between the rodent and the human world to kind of have the same measure in, 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 um, the, in the same brain at the same time. We're interested in the role of oscillations as well. Um, offline, what's the difference between offline versus online reactivation? So a lot of the work I talked about was the, in the beginning was when people were resting more offline. You can also think of this as below the level of consciousness. Your brain is likely reactivating and replaying lots of things that may not become um, um, available to you. And what happens when it does, when you're actively retrieving or when you're aware of a representation, you then can probably make it more malleable. Um, that might strengthen that of individual memory, but it might actually produce more inhibition of related memory. So we're interested in how conscious retrieval may differ from offline replay, rapid replay. And then another important question is when are replay events triggered? Um, we have some ideas about that and you can ask Dave about that as well. Dave Cluett would love to talk about that. And of course, critical um, in all of this work is a very sort of brain-based talk, but uh, we really wanna link these changes with future behavior. Um, to, to allow us to understand why we have consolidation, why representations become overlapping, how that helps um, um, in adaptive behavior. What does it do for us? And finally, I'll just say that the part of the, the part three, um, other consequences of reactive, reactivation of mental states, we are really obsessed with memory and replay. But when we started to look at this data, we, I started to think, well, look, this is really interesting. This is challenging a lot, this is gonna get very philosophical. I started to think about free will and like, who am I right now? Do I think that I'm making a decision now based on all the evidence in front of me? Or really, my, if my brain is showing persistence of the preceding experiences I've had today, or maybe over days, there's a lot more complexity to the kinds of information that, are, that really probably is available to us when we're making decisions in the moment. And so we've done some work looking at uh, how our current experience um, is actually influences future behavior. So we've shown that emotional brain states carry over and actually change the way you remember neutral information. And also 
link back into the past. So new learning and new experience can actually reach back into the past and increase the consolidation of experiences you've already encountered. And just to say thank you to everyone who did all the hard work and thanks to you guys for your attention. Thanks very much. Um, maybe 